good morning. What I want to do in this video is walk through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, through 10, which is a tall order, so we'll see how it goes. Well, as we said in class, 1 Corinthians 7 begins a part of the letter where Paul answers questions that they wrote uh, to him about. Um, we see this in 7.1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And the quotations, of course, there's no quotations in Greek, at least not in the, uh, the Greek of the time of Paul. And so anytime you see the quotes here in 1 Corinthians, it is an interpretation. That is, uh, whoever has uh, translated, whatever committee has translated uh, 1 Corinthians, has made an interpretive decision as to when Paul, uh, they think Paul is quoting um, from the letter. Um, so here, the, the NRSV, which I happen to have up here, uh, gives us a fairly, uh, fairly literal uh, translation. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Uh, what were they thinking when they wrote that? We talked about this a little bit in class, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the first part of chapter 7, because we did talk about it uh, at length in class. Uh, but he, most, I think everybody agrees that touch here is a euphemism for having sexual relations. Uh, so is he talking about women in general? Um, uh, which is su somewhat surprising uh, because we certainly today as Christians do not think of uh, sexual relationships as being negative or evil or dirty or anything like that. We think today, I think rightly, we think God created uh, sex and that this is part of uh, uh, humanity. Um, and, and it's good, and that uh, the key is that it's done within the right context. That it's done within the context of a loving relationship of marriage, not, uh, you know, just wherever or who, with whomever. Uh, and so um, the idea that the Corinthians might think it's good for guys not to have sex, you know, well, that's kind of strange. Uh, but this seems to be something that they were writing to him, and Paul doesn't directly contradict them. Um, he just, again, as he does a lot in 1 Corinthians, he takes them where they're at and tries to steer them in the right direction. And so he basically says, um, yes, it would be great if, a, if uh, people were able to be celibate. Um, again, he changes by the time he gets to uh, 1 uh, uh, Timothy 5 is a little different uh, than what the instruction here which reminds us uh, that the Bible was written um, to address uh, particular situations. Paul's letters are what we, what we call occasional letters. They're written on occasions. They were written to address particular situations. That means that they weren't designed uh, in a lot of it. For example, 1 Corinthians was not designed to apply equally to all times and all places. We as the church we as the people of God have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That is to say, we have to wrestle with texts like this uh, to decide what what aspects of this not only dealt with that time, but dealt with that situation, um, and which parts uh, are trans-situational or trans-cultural. Now, of course, every time and place is cultural. Uh, we shouldn't think that we're, finally, we're not cultural. We are cultural. It's kind of like, uh, what, what's going on right now in studies of, of whiteness um, is that people like me who are quote unquote white, um, we don't realize the, the water we're swimming in. We tend to think of, well, um, white isn't a culture. Um, white is the default. Well, I'm, just, I'm just being a person. Well, that's what everybody thinks uh, when they're the dominant person in their culture. It's kind of like an accent. I, you know, I don't have an accent. You know, I might say to myself, it's the British who have an accent, or it's the Southerners who have an accent. Well, I have an accent. I remember uh, when I was doing my doctoral program, there was this German girl uh, who imitated the American accent. It was very funny. Um, but So I have an accent. I just don't realize it uh, because most of the people I'm around talk like I do. Well, all I'm getting at is every time and place has a culture. We have a culture. Uh, and so uh, the this was written for a particular time, culture, and situation, and in applying the Bible, that is when we move it to the next level, when we move beyond a kind of pre-modern lack of awareness to a more deeper, a deeper understanding 
uh, of the scripture in context, then we just have to start asking questions like, what aspects of the culture and situation uh, formed the instruction here? That's just the way it is. There's no way around it. Um, uh, and so then we ask, what is the all time in the that time uh, that I can apply in this time? Well, okay, so um, Paul has a very practical view of sexual relations here in chapter 7. It's not that we don't find the lofty uh, discussion of marriage here uh, that we find in Ephesians. Uh, as Christ loved the church, and that's not what we find in 1 Corinthians 7. We find a very pragmatic, practical Paul here, where he basically says, if you could be celibate, that'd be great, uh, but because most people can't control themselves, let's get married. Um, that's basically what he says. Now, um, he says in the first part, husbands and wives should have sex because otherwise they're just uh, uh, begging for trouble, as it were. If husbands and wives aren't having sex with each other, uh, they're going to be uh, tempted to go somewhere else. Do not verse 5, do not deprive one another except maybe by agreement. Now, that's, you know, these are, uh, I, 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 in class I dared you to preach on this. <laughs> But uh, what Paul says here, I think, is uh, very practical. Um, and sex is one of, I think, probably the third, um, the third num number, uh, the third most prevalent cause of, of marital conflict. But anyway, this is not a counseling course, but it is a Bible course. Uh, Paul gives some instructions about marriage and divorce. Again, Paul is not. Uh, Paul is. What does Paul think he's writing here? He doesn't know he's writing scripture. We talked about that in class because he says, this I say, not the Lord. Now we know the Lord is saying it too because we know Paul is inspired. But Paul didn't know he was inspired to the level we know he was inspired. Um, and so Paul distinguishes between what Jesus said when he was on earth and what Paul says is his uh, advice. But again, Paul is writing for the Corinthians. He's not writing a Pharisaic manual uh, for all time. He's not. He's not writing the Talmud or the Mishnah um, in terms of this is what you do in every every current circumstance regard to divorce. This is meant to be, uh, the, uh, as we said in class, uh, ethics of all kinds is improvisational. You cannot, you simply, it is impossible to anticipate every ethical situation in all of its nuances. Therefore, all application of ethics. This is an important point. All application of ethics involves the improvisation of the Holy Spirit. We cannot set it all out in law or in, in legality. That's what the Pharisees tried to do. And there's an impulse, I think, among my, my Christian circles to try to lay out very specifically all the rules. Um, we call it the discipline in the Wesleyan Church. You can't do it. It is impossible. And not only that, but when you begin to move to that level of legislation, you inevitably begin to oppress uh, situations where it just doesn't occur. All ethics requires improvisation. It must be done on the individual level, ultimately. Um, and so we have to get the spirit inside of us. We have to get the big principles inside of us so that when the specific situations come, the Holy Spirit helps us do the right thing. You just can't legislate it. You can't come with an. You can't come up uh, with a every situation list on when not when it's okay to divorce. In my opinion, that's the spirit of the Pharisees. That's the spirit that Jesus and Paul were against. It just that's not the way to do it. Okay, well now I'm actually getting to the part where we kind of left off. Um, this central section of First Corinthians seven, uh, Paul talks about. Um, um, various callings that people have, um, different situations we find ourselves in. Now, of course, we're much more mobile with regard to life calling in America uh, than most times and places have been. Um, we live, I personally think that it is, uh, it is a wonderful thing. I don't have to be an insurance adjuster just because my father was an insurance adjuster. I don't have to be a business person, as it were, uh, because my father worked for a business. I can be called a ministry. Um, you, can, you don't have to be uh, what your parents are. Um, we are able, in our world, this is a wonderful thing. We are able to be what we want to be uh, within our abilities and opportunities. Now, of course, it's true. Um, a person like myself, 
who, who was raised in a kind of uh, middle class, uh, white context in the late 20th century, I have a lot more opportunities than other people do. There are people who simply do not have the opportunities uh, that I have. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't, it's part of whiteness, not knowing that there are people who don't have the opportunities that I have. Um, but uh, one of the nice, great things about uh, modern America is that we, we have far more flexibility um, than people used to, uh, or that a lot of other people do, even today. But Paul, uh, Paul gives this uh, instruction in that time, and, and most, I think most would say he has the expectation that the Lord will come back soon. That's part of the context. Um, and so Paul is giving a sense of urgency, um, a context of urgency that we haven't always experienced as the church. And of course, when we get to 1 Timothy 5, which we won't in this course, um, that urgency is not there, I don't think, in this way. And it changes Paul's um, ethic a little bit. So he basically says, um, don't worry about changing your social status. Um, were, you circ were you circumcised when you became a Christian? Well, of course, don't try to become uncircumcised. Uh, were you uncircumcised when you became a Christian? Well, don't worry about it. Because circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Obeying the commandments of God is everything. So just, you know, don't, that's not important. Whether you're a Jew or, or a Gentile uh, is not important at this particular point in history. Um, and I would say it remains unimportant um, uh, today uh, for, for the church. What is obeying the commandments of God? Well, I think Paul in a, a couple places, Galatians 3, I think it is, and Romans 13, Paul says that loving your neighbor fulfills the law. So loving your neighbor is, is everything, not whether you're circumcised or not. Now here he goes on in 21, were you enslaved? Don't be concerned about it. If you can gain your freedom, you know, great. If, if, uh, if you can't, make use of your present uh, condition. So whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is freed to the Lord, and whoever is free is a slave of Christ. So we're all slaves. We're all slaves of, of God and Christ. Um, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human masters. That is, even if we're slaves, we're not slaves. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, uh, stay with God. Now, you, I can guarantee you that in the early 1800s, uh, this passage was quoted a lot. Um, and so there's an example in the early 1800s of people... Uh, not discerning the situation in which Paul was writing. Paul was writing this for a time when he thought that the Lord was coming back soon. And of course, being a servant in the in the Roman Empire often was not nearly as uh, despicable uh, as what slavery was uh, in America. Um, and so uh, when, when, when America had the chance to do away with slavery and make the world more like the kingdom of God, or when England had the opportunity to do away with slavery, that was a good thing. Um, and it made the world more like the kingdom of God. If we have, we have a chance to do away with uh, parts of slavery today, sex trafficking, and, and, and there's still slavery, uh, maybe more slavery in our world today than ever, uh, some have said. And so if we can do, do away with that, and that makes the world more like the kingdom of God, doesn't it? Um, and so we shouldn't think that uh, just because um, uh, this was written for a particular situation then that we should just leave, uh, leave it that way today. If we, if we could make the world more like the kingdom of God, why wouldn't we do it? And so this is a, this is a hermeneutical uh, experiment and test case here where Paul talks about something where uh, it, when he thinks that the Lord is coming back immediately, he gives this instruction to just stay in whatever situation you're in, uh, but it would not please the Lord if we can if we can make the world a better place, as it were. If we can make the world more like heaven, uh, then why wouldn't we do it? Then we we actually, if we follow the letter of what Paul says here, find ourselves fighting God. Uh, I of course uh, think the same situation exists with regard to the possibilities of women uh, in the world today. Um, that if we if we if we literally uh, keep ourselves to something that every, you know, like uh, the husband is the the head of the wife, that's not distinctly Christian teaching. Everybody thought that at the time of the Bible, um, and so a world in which uh, women are empowered in a way that they weren't uh, in the biblical world—that's a world closer to heaven. That's a world closer to the kingdom of God. 
and we and we find ourselves actually fighting good, uh, which means that we find ourselves fighting God, if we go literal on those sorts of things, because we're not discerning the difference between that time and all time. This is a this is a matter of much. Uh, uh, discussion and struggle in the church so I'm not saying just believe it because Ken says it I'm saying that uh, this is my understanding of the hermeneutical situation um, and something that the church needs to work out its salvation with fear and trembling in relation to now he finally gets to uh, the question of virgins um, which he says now concerning virgins and so we assume that here Paul is uh, discussing um, uh, something that they've written to him in their letter. Uh, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord. That is to say, Jesus didn't say anything about this subject when he was on earth. And in fact, Paul seems to say, I've not received, uh, he might be saying also, I've not received any revelation on this subject. What should virgins do? But I give my opinion as one who is, the Lord, who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Um, so, uh, and, and he'll say at the end of this section, uh, I think I also have the Spirit of God down there in verse 40. Um, and of course, uh, we know he was inspired by faith, and therefore uh, he did have the Spirit of God, and this is considered uh, inspired scripture here. So, uh, should virgins marry? He says, I think in view of the impending crisis, it is well for you to remain as you are. Again, he recommends uh, that virgins remain unmarried, uh, that, that uh, men and women don't get married, but uh, work for the gospel. Now again, this is not a timeless command. When we get to 1 uh, Timothy 5, uh, there is strong instruction to marry, and there's instruction for virgins under a certain age. I think it's 40, uh, maybe 60, I can't remember, 40 or 60, instruction to remarry. Um, and so this is situational instruction. What is the impending crisis? I think Paul thinks the Lord's coming back. Um, there are some uh, ben Witherington, for example, if I remember right, argues that it's something else. Um, to me, that's just trying to get out of the obvious reading. Um, and I, I don't think this is helpful. I don't think it's helpful that because of our some idea we have of what the Bible can and cannot say, that therefore we're going to twist the meaning of verses to make it fit with my my denominational issues or my my construct issues. Uh, it, it, it really seems like Paul is talking about the fact that Jesus is coming back soon. And so how is, it, how is it godly to not listen to what Scripture is saying? How is it godly that because of my idea of Scripture, I'm going to take the most obvious reading of the Scripture and I'm going to twist it because of my idea of what the Bible cannot say? Does that make us more godly or more truthful? No, I think that's part of the mess the American church is in right now. Uh, because we don't, we're not willing to, to, to follow the most obvious understandings, and, and that includes hermeneutic as well. Now, that does, so I, 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 my philosophy is let the Bible say what it says, and then we'll get together in our theology and in our ethics, and we'll work out the problems. Um, and so the, where, where we're working out our salvation is in this, in this community of faith, uh, discussing the text theologically and ethically, um, but recognizing that the biblical texts were written at times and places and cultures and situations, and 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 it does us no good um, to to not listen to what it says. And it just seems to me here uh, that he is suggesting that the Lord is coming back soon. Um, Twenty nine, I brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let those who have wives be as though they had none, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, because, you know, the resurrection is going to happen soon, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as if they had no possessions, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with them, for this present form of the world is passing away. I read that, and I think the overwhelmingly most obvious way to take this is, he thinks the Lord's coming back. Now, there are ingenious people out there who can come up, ah, but what if he had, you know, oh, um, a snail in his pocket when he wrote this, and therefore he had an itch, and he was, I mean, you can come up with the most ingenious way um, to come up with some other interpretation, but I think it honors God the most to just say, this is what it seems to be saying. 
and and then we work it out you know well this was that time or this was that situation or this was that culture uh, but let's be honest with what the scripture seems to say re recognizing that the scriptures were written at a time and place uh, and then we we wrestle with it together not because we're not because we're trying to get out of stuff but because this is the way it simply is and because sometimes by not taking that into account we work against god and we find ourselves arguing you know like they did uh, uh, in favor of slavery or something like that this is a trick of the devil this is a trick of the devil to use the literal meaning of scripture in order to do evil in the world today and so we let's let the text say what it says let's be honest with the text and then let's get together in communities of faith with experts and theologians and spiritual people uh, and and work it out um, that's the method I think that has it's one the intelligent method it's not the stupid method uh, it has intelligence and it's also I think the way of, of the spirit um, so I got a little bit on my my hobby horse but I think the church is in trouble uh, today um, on every side okay so what is his advice to virgins stay the way you are um, are you married verse 27 are you married don't try to get unmarried are you divorced now this are you free from a wife uh, the NIV struggles with that the old NIV really played games with that one the, the new NIV has at least gotten a little bit more honest with its translation but I think he says are you divorced don't seek a wife uh, but if you marry you don't sin and if a virgin marries she doesn't sin I, I've read this you know in the Greek and I don't have wireless where I'm sitting right now so I can't I can't pull up blue letter Bible uh, but I think there's a little bit of a double standard here he tells women not to remarry up at the top but here he's talking to men um, you know because he says are you are you married don't don't try to get unmarried do you are you bound to a wife he's talking to the man right are you a man bound to a wife don't try to divorce her are you a man who's divorced don't try to get a wife but if you do get a mar get a wife you don't sin um, and if a unmarried virgin marries she does not sin this is this is very cultural I think because there's a bit of a double standard in this chapter the woman can't remarry but the man can uh, even if he's divorced again we remember Paul is not writing in a vacuum he's writing at a particular time and place uh, and that that uh, affects the instruction he gives if we rip this out of uh, the time and place and put it on a sign on the wall and try to make it all time we run the risk at times of being oppressive or of doing things that actually aren't uh, certainly aren't love of God and neighbor so these are the things we have to wrestle together with and that denominations do wrestle uh, together with to try to find their way on what kinds of instructions to give those who are in their fellowship well uh, here we have some famous words in verse 32 I want you to be free from anxieties the unmarried man is anxious about the Lord uh, but the married man is anxious about the affairs of his wife and his family his interests are divided certainly this should be the case there are some workaholic uh, pastors and, uh, and let's extend this to women pastors as well there are some men and women who are so workaholic uh, that they don't spend time with their family and their families are sometimes lost uh, to Christian Christ uh, because of their their busyness uh, Sabbath is important uh, but Paul does indicate here uh, and John Wesley even failed at this I think uh, that we need to give time to our families it's not just about uh, when we're married we have made a commitment to our families and our spouses and so it's not just about I'm not going to spend any attention to my family because I am minister hear me roar um, that's not the way it is Paul uh, suggests here that uh, pastors have an obligation uh, to their families um, that our attention should be divided between our ministry and our family if we're if we have a family if you can remain celibate uh, you know Paul says uh, uh, if you can do it do it um, where's the verse we I think I somehow skipped it where he says it's better to marry than to burn uh, he doesn't mean burn in hell by the way he means burn with passion um, let me see maybe up here at the uh, I wish that all were as I am but I have a particular gift okay verse 9 um, the unmarried I say it's well to remain unmarried uh, but if you can't control yourselves you know get married 
It's better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Very practical. This is not Ephesians. He's basically saying, uh, and by the way, there's an Im implication here um, that sex before marriage is not good. Um, he's basically saying sex should be done within the context of marriage. And therefore, uh, that, so there's an implication here uh, that, that sex before marriage is not the ideal situation. Sex is a dangerous thing. Sex is a powerful thing. And, and there is a principle here. I mean, we can legislate it and say sex should only be done within the context of marriage. I think that's basically Paul's position. But, but there's a sense that sex creates all kinds of entanglements. Um, and that, that therefore sex needs to be focused within a marriage uh, so that, so that uh, these other unloving situations, non-love of neighbor, you know, so that, so that uh, the, the, these damaging things don't happen. Sex needs to be focused within a committed uh, marriage relationship. Well, okay. So I think uh, those of you who have been wondering, where is the verse that says uh, that um, uh, you shouldn't have sex before marriage? I think that's implied in verse 9 there. Sex before marriage is a dangerous situation um, full of all kinds of pitfalls. Sex should be done within the context of marriage and within the context of a commitment. Um, so... Um, we get down to the end of the chapter uh, where he, in verse 36 through 38 is an interesting conundrum. If anyone thinks he's not behaving properly toward his fiance, um, let's, go, let's go with the NRSV here and see where, where it goes. Uh, his passions are strong. He has to be. Let him marry. It's no sin. Let them marry. Um, so again, this is an implica implication here that sex before marriage is not ideal. Um, that you should get married. Um, if someone stands, but on the other hand, if someone stands firm in his resolve, uh, it is a little one-sided. Again, this is part of the cultural dimension of, of Paul's world. He's, he's addressing the man because the men had control over these things uh, in that world. Um, in this world, men and women have control. It's, that's On the one hand, it's more like the kingdom of God where both men and women have power. Uh, that's more like heaven. So the world, the secular world, is a better place in the sense that that women have uh, authority in these matters and not just men. That's a good thing. Um, uh, in in Paul's world, the man had control. Um, so if you, you if you can't control yourself, he says, marry your fiance. If someone stands firm in his resolve, under no necessity, having his own desire, he's determined his own mind to keep her as his fiance. Lord's coming back anyway. In so many words, you'll do well. If you get married, that's good too, he says. Um, and so, but, you know, again, in Paul's world, he's saying celibacy uh, is better. Um, again, First Timothy First Timothy doesn't say that. So there's a very situational uh, component to Paul's uh, instruction here. Now, uh, interestingly, if you look at the New American Standard Bible on these verses, it takes it a different way, which is very interesting. Um, the, the, there's ambiguity in the Greek, it seems to me. And so the NASB goes with the interpretation that if anyone um, uh, thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his virgin daughter, it's the father in the NASB who's making the decisions, um, let, let her get married. Um, so it's, in the NASB, it's not about you deciding whether to marry your fiancé. Uh, in the NASB, it's a father trying to decide whether, whether to marry off uh, his daughter. Um, and it basically says that if the father can handle having uh, a virgin daughter who never gets married, that's good. Again, um, not apply that to today because we don't know if the Lord's coming back. And uh, in Paul's day at the time, he thought the Lord would come back before he died. By the time he writes Philippians, it seems like Paul has, has recognized that he might actually die uh, before the Lord comes back. Here we have final general statements at the end of chapter seven. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if he dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, only in the Lord. Again, here Paul suggesting that we should only marry people who are believers, um, because if, if faith is an essential part uh, of who we are, then if we marry someone who doesn't have faith, then the part of us, then the most important part of us, as it were, is going to be uh, distracted and tempted away. Um, and so Paul basically says um, that... Um, we must remarry in the Lord, or we should remarry in the Lord. 
Yeah, but in my judgment, he says, verse 40, she is more blessed if she re remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Yes, he does. Now, Paul had the Spirit of God. He was writing inspired instruction for the Corinthians at that time and place uh, and culture. Well, I think I'm going to stop the recording here so I have uh, a recording somewhat dedicated on 1 Corinthians 7, uh, and I will continue with another recording on uh, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 in a moment as far as I'm concerned. As far as you're concerned, I have no idea. Thank you.